Welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today to have a conversation to celebrate together the World Biodiversity Day in 2020. We are together in a very unusual uh, context and um, very specific times, very uncertain times, but we wanted to celebrate the Biodiversity Day and this year the theme is Our Solutions Are in Nature um together and to make sure that uh we would make the connection with you um bet be between what is happening in the world the pandemic and the biodiversity so i'm going to ask you some questions and uh, you can interact with each other of course and i will start first by asking um Eduardo Brondizio, who is the co-chair of the IBES uh, Global Assessment Report that was released in UNESCO one year ago, exactly one year ago, and that provided uh, key recommendations to the decision makers and to the world about the importance of biodiversity. I would like first to start with you, Eduardo, and to ask you, uh, you know, what is, um, what is the, what has happened since this report went out? school for carrying on this event you know with the pandemic that we're facing i think you know many of us have been thinking about the you know whether you put uh, issues like biodiversity and climate aside you know considering the, the issues that we're facing and it has become very clear that you know uh, those issues are all interconnected and important so congratulations on bringing this together particularly at this time it has been one year, a fantastic year, if we consider the impact of the global assessment. And I'll call attention to two dimensions, I think, why it has been so impactful during this past year and why it's so relevant today. You see, what we did, you know, we didn't only did the, an assessment of specific issues of biodiversity and ecosystems, but we were able to tell a story, a story that connects changes in the environment with our own development ideas in our own values and i think that what makes the global assessment so imp impactful because it tells a story to all of us that we can understand so i think we made during this past year we made biodiversity and ecosystems front and center an issue that cannot be ignored and I, I think there are three reasons for that first is they scale i think we're able to show at a global level without disregarding regional differences the critical global state of biodiversity loss and nature degradation. And I think that became apparent to people, you know, at the same level that today we have uh, climate change. The second issue I think is that we made a connection to the consequence. You know, so we show how much, how dramatically we have configured the biosphere, but also how progressively we are eroding the very foundations of our economy of our livelihoods, our health, water and food security, and quality of life more broadly, in, in a way that is very unequal. And that's another important message, I think, that allowed the global assessment to be updated so strongly, because it speaks to the reality of people on the ground. And the third issue is the value of nature. I think that's one contribution that we made to really bring the visible, to make it visible, the true value of nature to our individual and collective well-being. So we've seen you know, citizens, local public administration, private sectors, the World Economic Forum, the G7, G20, really bringing biodiversity to their conversation. I think slowly we're starting to consider the actual value uh, of nature to our lives. Now, why it's important today, I think, is for three reasons. Um, we bring a historical perspective, and that's really key. You know, the reality that we're facing today is not new. It has been taking shape for decades. We have been acting on it, but not enough to, to change those impacts. So what we see today is the aggregated impact that we have done over many years, and the compounding effect. You know, the COVID pandemic reminds us that we live in a network and interdependent world, right? And that's what we show in the global assessment. So we need to have that historical perspective of how those things developed, you know, and how can we think forward 
a way of avoiding the kinds of uncertainties and risks that these kinds of connections have created. The second point that makes it relevant today is that it offers a scientific understanding, right? So it puts together the challenges of biodiversity, climate change, the sustainable development, development goals, and the pandemic as interconnected. And that's how we need to think about trying to move forward. And finally, we offer an inclusive framework to discuss transformative change, which at this time is particularly important. You know, we need to think about how do we recover in a way that is more sustainable and socially fair. Thank you. So it's great to look back a year and see how much we have contributed and that we're still today, you know, very much um, on top of the conversation of those challenges. Thank you very much, Eduardo. That's very useful to, to see the progress that has been made since one year and the role of science and scientists and researchers in uh, analyzing the drivers, both indirect and direct, on the causes of uh, biodiversity loss and how it's crucial uh, today uh, in this uh, time we are living in, especially this year. Uh, Elizabeth Mahema, you are the acting executive secretary of the convention of biological diversity. It was, and it's still, I hope, a super year for biodiversity 2020. You were leading major negotiations for the post-2020 agenda, and everything uh, was completely disturbed and postponed this year. So my first question to you is that these negotiations that you are leading with the CBD, um, what does already this pandemic is teaching us? If we can make a, a little pause now, there are many certain things, but already what is your analysis of what you have learned and uh, in, in these uncertain times? Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for this invitation. The super year for biodiversity continues in fact and expanded actually to not only include the 2020 we are in, but also next year. Why I'm saying also next year, fortunately, the situation as it is with all the postponements of the major processes or meetings, we will possibly have three key biodiversity decertification and climate change conferences of the parties to take place. So the super year campaign on biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity for desertification for climate change continues and hope will continue to gain momentum. For 2020, yes, we've been disrupted, but we can see all actions continue as we are meeting now virtually. So a number of meetings have continued, in fact, increased because we have all discovered that we can still connect virtually and even at hardly minimal or no cost at all. The pandemic has taught us also that humanity is placing too many pressures on the natural world with the damaging consequences, and Eduardo has alluded to that. COVID-19, where we are now, has also reaffirmed that biodiversity is fundamental for human health. The pandemic has reminded us of the urgent need to protect it. It, is also, it is also telling us that by protecting biodiversity will actually be addressing the underlying drivers of disease emergencies. As the result of uh, ecosystem degradation, particularly deforestation and unsustainable agriculture with uh, decline in species richness and population, there are more opportunities or that situation creates more opportunities for path pathogens to pass from wild and domestic animals to people. We therefore need to minimize the unnecessary disturbance to the natural systems to help mitigate the potential emergency of new pathogens and reduce the risk and incidences of infectious diseases. In the months to come, the most vulnerable in our world, in particular those living in developing countries, are going to be faced with the prospects of hunger, poverty, and unemployment, among others. And people will actually now turn more to biodiversity for food, for fuel, and other necessities. So sustainable use of biodiversity now become even more crucial uh, to be achieved. The lesson we need to embrace in the next half of the year and beyond 
is that the world opens, econ will open the economies. There will be no return back to normal. In other words, and our Secretary General has underlined, we all need to build back better. Normal has meant cutting down huge stretches of forest to plant crops, to intensify agriculture, to intensify livestock at the expense of wildlife habitat. The normal has also accelerated global warming, which has stressed uh, wild species and the habitats, making humans more susceptible to zoonotic diseases. Governments, therefore, should respond to COVID-19 crisis by making policies and investment decisions that will address biodiversity and climate emergencies while embracing green economic growth and green jobs. 2030 Agenda, Sustainable Development Goals, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, all these will provide and continue to provide that best avenue, best chance and opportunity for the brighter, uh, brighter future. So the campaign continues and let's move together to really make this year and the following year the super year for biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Yes, indeed, there are lots of connections. Eduardo has already uh, highlighted the interdependency, interconnection we have with the living world. Elizabeth, you've just uh, re-emphasized the importance of continuing the work together on the agenda, even if it's postponed, it's even more crucial these days. And I would like to ask now um, Shamila Nair Bedwell, which is a sous-directrice générale pour le secteur des sciences exactes et naturelles at UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO participates in the ongoing negotiation that Elizabeth has just mentioned in all the big events, all the negotiations, the CBD, the post-2020 at the UN level. It's also one of the four UN partners of IBES that Eduardo has just referred to, how important and crucial the uh, global assessment report uh, was uh, released and uh, the recommendations. Um, and UNESCO has many scientific programs working on biodiversity, such as the Man and the Biosphere program. So does the current crisis and uh, the period that we are collectively living together with the pose is changing uh, the way that UNESCO is going to uh, look at biodiversity uh, and um, in its program and its work in the coming uh, months, years? At uh, Miriam and uh, good afternoon, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all again and uh, it's also a pleasure to see all the ideas and thoughts uh, converging. Uh, to answer your question, Miriam, yes. The crisis reminds us that we really need a multifaceted, forward-looking approach. The constitution of UNESCO calls for building peace in the minds of men and women. How can one build peace in the minds of men and women if we cannot assure equality and access to the values that biodiversity offers us today, since all human beings are completely dependent on biodiversity for their well-being? Now, uh, this multifaceted forward-looking approach calls upon bringing and changing human values and behavior, as Eduardo has called for, Elizabeth has called for, in addressing probably the food crisis, the agricultural crisis. But that also means changing mindsets through the education, culture, science, and communication for the sustainable use of biodiversity. There is a fragile link between humans and nature, and this pandemic has demonstrated that. Hence, UNESCO's role in this particular crisis is to increase the awareness and appreciation uh, and to amplify the voice of biodiversity crucial uh, for, for our survival. The science in UNESCO was elaborated since the early days of the constitution of the organization. And these science programs comprise a multitude of intergovernmental scientific programs, international scientific programs. And among these is the restoration, conservation, preservation, and sustainable use of biodiversity through a number of different designated sites. These sites are the World Network of Biosphere Reserves, 701 in 120 countries. 
In one country in particular, like Costa Rica, the biosphere reserves cover 52% of the territory. So we see really a forward-looking approach by member states to preserve, conserve, and to restore biodiversity at national level. The other designated sites, such as the World Heritage Sites and the Global Geoparks, also contribute through the science programs for the monitoring, science monitoring, and linking the different knowledge streams, enabling people to live in harmony with nature. So these conservation policies and strategies date back to the 1945 and the World Network of Biosphere Reserves in UNESCO started some 40 years ago. So UNESCO is not a new player uh, in the world of biosphere, uh, biodiversity conservation and preservation. Rather, I would say that the policies and strategies developed over 40 years support the broader objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals as highlighted by um, Elizabeth Nmrema. So the role of all of these designated sites and the biosphere reserves is to promote and foster this harmonious integration between people and nature for sustainable development and sustainable use of nature. Now, through these networks of UNESCO sites, plus the some 80, um, I would say, category two centers, of science, UNESCO is promoting international scientific collaboration because we see more and more that the crisis is anchored in science or science is anchored in the crisis. The both feed each other in order to be able to understand the crisis and to understand the role of biodiversity for, for, for human well-being. So through UNESCO scientific programs, its multitude of chairs, the uh, over 80 networks of excellence, intergovernmental programs. We are also promoting partnerships and the private sector to build the consensus for transformation, to conserve and sustainable use of biodiversity. I would also like to say we're also working together in knowledge co-creation to understand ecosystem services. And we will not be able to do that without the indigenous knowledge people and the information they bring as important partners to the table of discussions. Hence, UNESCO hosts the technical support unit uh, for indigenous knowledge people. And I fully agree with the, uh, Eduardo and with Elizabeth, we need to be able to connect the scales. Connecting the scales means bringing together education, culture, science, and communication to understand our impact on the only one planet that we have. And as one of our leaders has said, there is no planet B. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamila, for uh, sharing uh, the UNESCO work and the perspective and the role of uh, science and evidence and evidence-based information that can uh, enable us to make good decisions and good options for the future, also building on the local and indigenous knowledge and building on the experience that it's possible to live in harmony with nature, as Shamila has, uh, has mentioned, it, it's a possibility. I would like to ask Serge Morand now, uh, qui est directeur de recherche au CNRS et qui est écologue de la santé et parasitologiste de terrain. Quel est son diagnostic sur euh, la crise, la pandémie que nous traversons Et vous avez fait de nombreux travaux qui avaient déjà démontré euh, ces interconnexions. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un peu plus Bonjour à tout le monde et merci vraiment de l'invitation. Je suis vraiment... Euh, plutôt impressionné d'être avec ce panel de, de très haut niveau. Je suis un, un écologiste de terrain, travaillant avec aussi bien les communautés locales sur les aspects santé, biodiversité, que m'intéressant finalement à la baisse totale de biodiversité, ses impacts sur les maladies émergentes, les maladies zoonotiques. C'est vrai que c'était un discours qui était difficile à faire passer, euh, pas tellement auprès des médecins, pas tellement auprès des vétérinaires qui avaient vraiment compris qu'il y avait quelque chose qui se, qui se faisait. Alors, si on regarde la crise du Covid, finalement, on a des certitudes et des incertitudes encore. Des incertitudes, c'est finalement bah, l'écologie. Quelle écologie de la transmission Comment expliquer finalement qu'un virus qui circulait tranquillement euh, dans des chauves-souris, euh, de, de quelque part en Asie, ait pu rencontrer un pangolin et, ou un autre, euh, autre intermédiaire puis un humain, commencer une petite chaîne de transmission pour se retrouver à Wuhan. Mais quand il est à Wuhan, là, on est dans les certitudes, finalement dans la certitude que dès qu'une maladie infectieuse, dès qu'une épidémie commence à apparaître dans un cluster, dans un hub de la mondialisation, il part partout. 
Et ça, c'est finalement des travaux qui montrent que depuis les années 60, les années 40, on a une augmentation du nombre d'épidémies, une augmentation du nombre de nouvelles épidémies, maladies infectieuses, et surtout, c'est la grande accélération de l'anthropocène. Mais depuis les années 60, nous avons surtout un changement complet, radical du patron des épidémies. On a finalement des épidémies qui deviennent plus mondialisées, des pandémies. Et, donc, et ces pandémies mettent en évidence cette mondialisation des marchandises et mondialisation du transport aérien. Il faut savoir que dans les années 70, il n'y avait que environ 330 millions de passagers aériens. En 2017, il y en avait 4 milliards. Et en même temps, si on a une augmentation des animaux domestiques, des animaux sauvages, des, et une baisse des animaux sauvages. Donc, on peut voir aussi que cette mondialisation affecte même en même temps notre relation avec l'animal et avec l'animal domestique, comme on l'a dit ensemble. Parce qu'au même moment, on a aussi une augmentation des maladies chez l'animal domestique. On a de plus en plus de pandémies aussi les concernant. On a de plus en plus de pandémies concernant aussi l'agriculture, les plantes. Et au même moment, on a cette baisse de la biodiversité et aussi, comme on en a parlé, cette baisse de la diversité culturelle et cette baisse de la diversité bioculturelle. Puisque je finirai peut-être que sur ce dernier message qui va nous faire penser après la suite, c'est que généralement après les crises sanitaires, notamment les crises sanitaires du monde animal, on développe plutôt les aspects biosécurité, biosurveillance. Et pour le côté animal, ça n'a fait que renforcer l'élevage industriel, le petit élevage ne pouvant pas survenir à la biosurveillance. Qu'est-ce qui se passe avec ça C'est une baisse de la diversité des races génétiques qui sont en train de disparaître au même moment. Je pense que c'est aussi cette réflexion que nous devons avoir. Merci. Merci beaucoup Serge, merci beaucoup pour cette analyse et ces, ces interconnexions entre le local et ce qui se passe au niveau global. On le voit bien avec vos exemples, l'accélération euh, qui euh, entraînée par la mondialisation et toutes les conséquences que nous subissons chacun d'entre nous actuellement euh, euh, partout où nous sommes sur cette planète. Donc encore cette, euh, cette euh, interconnexion de ce qui s'est passé à un endroit du monde qui nous touche dans tous les coins de la planète. Donc ça, c'est aussi un des grands enseignements. Et j'ai envie de demander à Eduardo, euh, qui a déjà évoqué hein, le rôle essentiel de la recherche, et Serge l'a rappelé euh, également avec Shamila, pour... Euh, faire des recommandations basées sur la preuve euh, pour qu'on ait des informations qui sont vérifiables dans, un, dans, un, dans une époque où il y a beaucoup de fake news et d'informations qui circulent. L'UNESCO s'est engagé euh, euh, pour justement contrecarrer euh, euh, ces, ces rumeurs qui se propagent. Et quel, est, quel est pour vous, Eduardo, le rôle euh, de la recherche, surtout dans cette période d'incertitude et dans cette période de transformation de transition que nous sommes amenés à vivre. Et comme l'a dit Elisabeth, on ne revient pas en arrière. Le secrétaire général a dit « build back better ». Quel va être le rôle de la recherche dans les prochains mois dans cette période complètement inédite d'incertitude et de transition <rire> oh, go in English again. I'm just following Serge. Um, excellent intervention. Um, so first, I think, as, as was just said, the first role that we have, I think, is confronting the complexity and the historical underpinnings that this issue involves. Right? I think there's a good example of how many different forces and networks are interacting, and you have the compounding effect of many features that we still are in the process of understanding. So that, that will be the first thing, confronting its complexity and collaborate together with not only other scientists, you know, but with a larger public to, to understand it. Confront questions that matter to society. I think we are exposed now with a reality that really needs attention, you know, that we have put aside. And, and I think we need to turn science into that, you know, the eyes into what, what is needed there. The third thing, make sure that science is the public good. I think we need to speak up very strongly for it at this particular time, right? So we share our knowledge to confront our, our problems. Fourth thing, communication, as you mentioned. I think we have a particular role now of leaving our, you know, sort of uh, uh, universities and research institutes and make sure that we communicate, that we engage with the public to clarify fake news, 
but also to uh, inform, you know, all of the, the complexity and, and the possibilities that we have going ahead. But there's one issue I think that is important. We have a very pressing matter at hand, so how to invest and how to put our efforts into the coming months, you know, in using this uh, unprecedented use of funds for recovery. So here, I think, you know, what we have made in the global assessment report in terms of scenarios, right, that we made evident that the current trend that we have is unsustainable and unfair, the pandemic made it explicit, right? The pandemic makes inequality and vulnerability evident. We cannot hide from it, right? And so how we direct these funds now, I think, you know, need to confront the inequalities that we have put aside for such a long time. The other thing that the pandemic, I think, does is to show the power of human adaptation and collective action and a desire for change, right? So I think what we are seeing is that, you know, we can make very tough choice in the name of, of public good. And so those two conditions that we have very evident inequality, right? But we have also evidence that we can mobilize and get together to confront issues I think this is the context in which we can talk about transformative change for the coming decade, right? What it shows is that we have a, a small window um, to act to avoid more dramatic consequences, you know, as climate change, biodiverse decline, pandemic, and other issues are coming together. So I want to I want to point to four issues that I think are critical at this particular time when policy is making policymakers are you know making decisions about how to use funds, uh, and in doing so without undermining, you know, uh, current social environmental conditions. So the first thing is environmental policy cannot be relaxed, right, in name of political expediencies or vested interests. And we have a role as a scientist to make sure that we keep calling attention to those issues, right, and the implication of those, what will be populist measures in the short term, have larger consequences for society in the long term. Second thing, directly related to the current uh, uh, subsidies and, and recovery packages. We need to reframe perverse subsidies, you know, many of which are behind these problems that we're facing today. You know, subsidies to business as usual practices in sectors like agriculture, forestry, fisheries, mining, energy, fossil fuels, infrastructure, they create incentives for a wasteful, polluting, degrading, and corrupting practices, right? We need to remember that the pandemic is an example of how much our activities, um, deforestation, extraction, agricultural expansion, infrastructure, you know, are behind a lot of emerging disease. And this is one example, right? So we need to confront vested interests uh, with the, you know, if we don't want to exacerbate those issues. There are many alternatives, and that's one of the, you know, the bright spots that we can think. There are alternatives in which we can convert those subsidies into incentives for promoting more socially and environmental sustainable systems, right? That are responsible, accountable, and transparent. And I think that offers you know, many alternatives for technological transitions in many sectors, for strengthening local economies, right? And to address some of the gaps that we have in basic infrastructure, basic social, social, social service for a lot, a large segment of the world population. The third point, uh, we need to start thinking more in the economic system, more in terms of precautionary, adaptive, integrated, and inclusive governance and management approaches. I think we have you know, very established frameworks like the One Health framework that helps to think and to plan interventions in a way that takes into account health, environment, and society, right? So there are opportunities for that that we should benefit from. Now, more broadly, to me, the question I think that, you know, it's, it's hanging in the room is what is the measure of success to assess recovery in a post-pandemic world? You know, we're still talking about economic growth based on GDP as a measure of success for recovery. If we continue that mindset and use that as a measure stick, we'll be, you know, missing most of the implications of the recovery package that we have, right? So we do need to step, you know, up, to incorporate multiple values of nature in environmental decisions, in financial decisions. We need to monitor responsibility, accountability, transparency of the economic system. You know, those are the issues that as scientists, we, we have an obligation to make sure that we put 
uh, our voice on, you know, make sure that, you know, we, we, we push those measures and those policies in a way that will benefit the most uh, without undermining biodiversity uh, and the most vulnerable in the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Embracing complexity, cooperating with all the different stakeholders uh, that need to take the biodiversity agenda and, uh, and the work of the scientists and the recommendation into a transformative change process. And I'm, I, I want to ask Elizabeth, this, um, this crisis has put a stop on all of us. We are all in a pause mode, but we are now gradually thinking about next steps. So is it an opportunity for, for you, for the CBD, for the negotiations to have more time to reflect on the issue that Eduardo has just raised and to make sure that we have a strong international agreement? What are the consequences of this postponement? Do you see it as something that is going to give more substance and more deep into the negotiations? Thank you very much and uh, many thanks to Eduardo on all the points he has raised. The longer time span actually for the negotiation of the post 2020 global uh, biodiversity framework has, been, has provided a good positive opportunity for the development of the framework for many reasons. One, you know, the, the, the the brain behind the framework in terms of putting substance on paper is on the co two co-chairs who are leading the process and who were really together with the team were all working under tight pressure of deadline to produce the document. You will recall in January, a zero draft was produced. It was discussed end of February, and then it was supposed to be ready by, by now for a, uh, two subsidiary bodies meetings, which will have been held end of this month, but of course all postponed. So it gave now this period more time for the co-chairs to reflect, to continue with the informal consultations and put the substance into the document. More so this time, uh, and of course we're in an unfortunate crisis situation of the pandemic, but this crisis situation has also bring, brought to the fore, brought to the table, and the better understanding of the importance of biodiversity, nature into our lives and the planet. And the scientific evidence, uh, as alluded by Eduardo, clearly explains that. We now understand nature, we now understand the impacts of human activity on nature, and what would, I'm sure, the world will not uh, forgive ourselves is to see now <clears throat> the new framework having not responding to the pandemic situation and providing those responses and solution to be able to avoid in future. If not for the pandemic, we'll probably either those, the goals, targets, and indicators may have not been as strong as probably now will be as the result of this pandemic. So this time has provided us uh, that opportunity. More so, this time has allowed us more time to build awareness and political will on the increasing risks of the zoonosis to human health, as well as the increased awareness worldwide on the risks of not protecting nature. So we hope that this situation will help the negotiators building from the uh, IH biodiversity targets. Consequently, this extra time uh, will allow all of us, the world community, the negotiators, to develop a robust and ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity uh, framework that will now be relevant to the post-pandemic period. The framework hopefully will be able to play a significant role in building the resilience we need in the face of growing environmental health and development challenges. The zero draft on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework had outlined five long-term goals 
related to our 2050 long-term vision for biodiversity living in harmony with nature. These goals are relevant to the pandemic context and are also an integral part of the sustainable development goals. So the proposals on the table include retaining and restoring a natural ecosystem, preventing their fragmentation and degradation, and expanding protected areas for nature, all to be able to ensure the ecosystem resilience. So by protecting nature, and preventing people from coming into contact with an untouched part of the wild, we can decrease the likelihood of future pandemics. We need to leave the animals in the forest by only leaving the forest intact and not to continue to deforest uh, it. Discussions on the post-2020 framework will also now highlight the linkages between biodiversity and health including the promotion and implementation of the One Health approach, which Eduardo also touched upon. The recently announced IPBS uh, panel on biodiversity and pandemics will provide us even more scientific basis uh, for us to base the policies in the future. So again, that panel comes in timely. Many countries we know will experience economic and are already experiencing economic hardships in response to the crisis. We know developing countries in particular will likely face uh, more severe challenges and all this will affect the negotiations of the framework. This pandemic and the international response that international cooperation is paramount for the health on, of our nature, our economies, and the people. The fight against uh, COVID-19 is also bringing to the forefront an unprecedented sense of collective solidarity, shared purpose, and community, I mean common humanity. We can harness all these positive forces in the negotiations to be able to achieve the goals of a healthy society and healthy planet. So we need to take this extra time to be able to do that and ensure that the framework when it is adopted is also uh, looked at these future prospects, response to future emergence of pandemic and therefore enable countries to be able to avoid emergencies diseases in future, but also all other uh, infectious diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, thank you very much for sharing that this time uh, is going to help to set hopefully a more ambitious and strong and solid um, a global agreement. And, and I would like to ask Shamila how UNESCO is going to play a role in that. How is UNESCO going to make sure that um, this global agreement is going to remain ambitious despite the difficulties that uh, were evoked by Elizabeth? What is going to be the role of UNESCO in ensuring that ambition and also um, making sure that biodiversity becomes very high, remains high on the agenda along climate change? And, uh, and values were mentioned by Eduardo, by Elizabeth, solidarity, making sure that biodiversity is linked to values and to the relationship people have with nature, and uh, what is going to be the role of UNESCO in, uh, in that process? Miriam? Hello, Miriam, can you hear me? Very well. Thank you, thank you very much. I think uh, this pandemic has taught us that really science is key to informing the pandemic, science is key to understanding nature, science is key to understanding the relations between people and nature. And yet the science capacity is not equally developed around the globe. And this significantly impacts then the ability of decision makers to really obtain accurate data and guidance on biodiversity risks and opportunities. Therefore, UNESCO launched the 
the UN recommendation for open science because open science will be a game changer to reduce the knowledge gaps between those who contain and have the international scientific knowledge and research, not only on the pandemic, but on nature and then the environment, and those that would need this access to this information. And hence, we have launched the global dialogue and consultations on what we would like to present next year to the governing board of UNESCO, as well as its 193 member states, um, called a recommendation on open science, because we do believe that science is really important, research is essential and critical to understanding the relations and the connections between the destruction of ecosystems and habitats for wildlife and uh, especially by human activities. And I think one other um, point I would like to raise is how UNESCO is going to contribute to the work of the Convention of Biodiversity and her work in collaboration with Elizabeth and her team and the international experts like Eduardo, as well as Serge Morin, is that we will continue as UNESCO to support the member states to address both the direct and the indirect drivers of biodiversity loss, as highlighted in the EPES Global Report, which was released in 2019 um, at the premises of UNESCO. We were delighted to host the EBES uh, during that period. And the reason for addressing the different drivers is because the future depends on the values which are shared. How to address the inequalities and the quality of our connections with biodiversity and other living species. And therefore, we are proposing to create this new type of movement, which is a reconciliation with nature, reconciliation with the living world, across the education, science, culture, and communication. And this type of new type of alliance for people and nature is really important. We need to be able to reconnect our values, as Eduardo said, and as Elizabeth brought out as well. We need to reconnect with our values for the living and to valorize what nature is offering to us. We need to build a global consensus on what is not acceptable and not possible anymore. We need to work together with partners. Um, these are the education partners, the culture, the communication partners, in order to accelerate the transformation process and the implementation of Agenda 2030, its SDGs, but also a brand new movement for the post 2020. And we look forward to working with our partners through this. So that is why we are also promoting through our networks, the solidarity, intergenerational equity and transmission of these values to the youth because after all uh, we leave the planet in the future for the future for our youth and so we need to transmit to the future generations the potential of the living this value for the living is crucial if we would want to inspire the positive actions and uh, this the programs of unesco will continue to support the post 2020 framework and also the movement towards it and the collaboration consensus and we look forward to working with elizabeth and her team i would like to say that reconnecting humans and nature recognizing the relationships between human and nature conserving the harmony of the ecosystems equity between generations is really for the future we want and we look forward to working with all of you uh, through all of its programs uh, of UNESCO to work with the expert and especially with Elizabeth and her team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamila. Thank you very much for putting, uh, uh, as Eduardo and Elizabeth, the importance of the relationship between humans with biodiversity and nature and the role of the values in this process, in this transformation. How we, which nature we want in the future, which development we want in the future. These are all uh, key questions uh, from a human perspective. Uh, and to build a movement where people are able to share their different points of view, their different values, and how we can, based on this diversity of values and world viewpoints, uh, build a world that is living in harmony with nature, which is what the CBD is, is uh, and all its partners are promoting for 2050. Maybe if we are optimistic, this crisis is making us also accelerate this and living in harmony with nature should happen now. We, should, we cannot wait any longer. 
uh, I'm going to ask Serge, um, with all this debate about values and the role of humans uh, in, um, in managing properly biodiversity, can we prevent, est-ce qu'on peut prévenir les prochaines pandémies? Et si oui, alors quelles approches on doit favoriser? C'est une question difficile et en fait, il y a deux façons de répondre. Il y a la, les pessimistes et les optimistes. Les pessimistes, ce sont ceux qui finalement vont se réfugier vers la technique, l'innovation, qui vont faire, faire, on va se préparer au pire. Et c'est déjà ça, quoi. C'était on se prépare au pire. On fait par exemple, et j'y participe, hein, le global virome. On va regarder tous les virus de toutes les espèces. On va faire aussi de l'intelligence artificielle pour essayer de prévoir partout. Ça va commencer à démarrer les épidémies. On va surveiller. Donc, et là, on va dire bah, il faut aussi surveiller la faune sauvage. Donc, on va les mettre aussi en surveillance, comme nous d'ailleurs, comme tous les, les animaux domestiques. Euh, et puis, on peut même faire le pire, c'est-à-dire qu'on dit bah, préparons-nous au pire des, 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 des virus, aux microbes. Faisons en fait, des manipulations, faisons ce qu'on appelle le gain de fonction. Et on va faire des gains de fonction pour créer le virus, bah, alors qu'il va tuer tout le monde. Quoi alors que finalement, il peut déjà exister dans la nature. Ça, c'est plutôt les visions pessimistes de, 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 de la vision. On se prépare, c'est préparedness. On se prépare au pire et puis finalement, on n'est jamais bien préparé, on le voit bien. Donc, et sinon, on a les scénarios optimistes. Les scénarios optimistes, c'est considérer que bah, peut-être ce n'est peut pas forcément la bonne question de se poser les pandémies, c'est-à-dire où ça va arriver et tout, mais peut-être de retravailler en se disant mais quels sont les territoires, quelles sont les configurations, quels sont les systèmes, les socio-systèmes, socio-écologico-systèmes qui sont en fait résilients aux pandémies, résilients à l'émergence. Donc finalement, il faut créer ce que j'essaie de contribuer avec quelques-uns, qui n'est pas encore le cas, une sociale écologie de la santé. Même au départ, j'étais un écologue, un écologue pur, je ne m'intéressais pas du tout aux humains, et finalement, par la santé, ça fait finalement complètement s'intéresser aux humains. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire finalement repenser la vision en termes d'habitat, en termes finalement d'habitat humain-animaux. Qu'est-ce qui sont en fait finalement cette, Comment ça fonctionne Comment ça un dynamisme même dans le temps et dans l'espace Quels sont en fait ces territoires Donc on a besoin de, de définir aussi, ça veut dire aussi qu'on va retravailler différemment. C'est-à-dire qu'on va travailler différemment avec les communautés et avec les administrations locales. Ça veut dire qu'on va créer finalement une pluridisciplinarité scientifique, mais aussi une pluralité de savoir, parce qu'en fait, on doit aussi, en tant que scientifique, s'acculturer avec le savoir local, s'acculturer aussi avec le savoir des praticiens. Ça, c'est ma longue expérience à travailler avec les médecins et avec les vétérinaires. La pensée écologiste, la plupart du temps, c'est trop complexe, trop compliqué, et finalement, au bout d'un moment, ils ne nous écoutent plus. Donc, on doit finalement aussi s'acculturer sur ça c'est-à-dire une pluridisciplinarité des savoirs et finalement une intersectorialité. Et à partir de là, on peut arriver finalement à travailler. Comment faire eh bien, Il nous faut aussi des observatoires. Des observatoires qu'on appelait avant Homme Nature. Et finalement, je crois qu'on les a à l'UNESCO. On a ces réserves de biosphère, on a ce programme, on a ces, ce Man of Biosphere. Je pense qu'il faut qu'on réagisse là-dessus, c'est-à-dire qu'on réimplémente et qu'on définisse aussi la santé au vrai sens de l'OMS, c'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas simplement que l'absence la, de maladie, d'être en bonne santé, mais c'est le bien-être. Et ça veut dire qu'on rechange aussi les valeurs, c'est-à-dire qu'on retravaille sur une éthique qui va être aussi l'éthique de, de la valeur, c'est peut-être très utilitariste, quoi, mais du bien-être humain, qui va se rebaser plutôt sur l'index de développement humain dans un cadre territorial. Merci, Merci. beaucoup Serge. Alors, euh... C'était ma question de conclusion, peut-être que je rebondis avec vous. Alors, optimiste ou pessimiste à la fin Est-ce qu'il y a des raisons d'espérer, Serge Alors, pour moi, il y a un côté très, très optimiste, c'est la jeunesse. C'est-à-dire, et ça, bon, je parle aussi à l'UNESCO, qui est aussi pour l'éducation. Quand je vois les jeunes, et notamment je vois les jeunes étudiants, partout, parce que j'enseigne en Asie, mais j'enseigne aussi de temps en temps dans d'autres pays en France, on a des étudiants, des jeunes qui sont absolument incroyables. Notre, ma génération, c'est la génération qui a tout détruit. C'est la génération de la grande accélération. Euh, c'est là où, en fait, on leur laisse un monde qui, 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 qui est quand même terrible. Ils en ont conscience. Mais ils en ont conscience pour finalement, pour se dire qu'ils vont le transformer vraiment et qu'ils veulent le remettre à leur 
à leur, à leur manière. Et que ce soit aussi dans les bons lieux partout, hein, que ce soit dans, 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 tous les, dans, tous les, dans, dans tous les dans tous les systèmes. Quoi. Et en plus, ils sont tellement bien qu'ils sont capables de pardonner à ma génération qui a tout bousillé. Donc vraiment, ils sont, ils sont remarquables. Et je pense qu'aussi, il y a des, des occasions aussi fantastiques. C'est parce que finalement, c'est la première fois dans toutes les interviews que j'ai pu avoir, dans pas mal de choses, aussi bien des très locales avec des télévisions de banlieue et tout, c'est qu'il y a un bouillonnement d'idées, un bouillonnement d'initiatives qu'on connaît pas assez dans toutes les communautés locales, qu'elles soient urbaines, qu'elles soient rurales. Il se passe plein de choses, partout en France comme ailleurs, comme en, comme en Asie. Et c'est peut-être ça qu'on a besoin plutôt de faire plus connaître, plus faire échanger, de faire ces réseaux de communication. Et aussi, de façon remarquable, que j'ai pu le voir, le troisième point qui est aussi positif, c'est finalement tous les fonctionnaires dans les administrations, de la santé, de la recherche, de l'éducation, de l'agriculture et dans les, dans les relations internationales, et je peux le voir avec le panel qu'on a autour, il y a de prises de conscience une prise finalement d'intérêt de voir que c'est quelque chose finalement de global à travailler qui me rend vraiment plutôt optimiste. Merci beaucoup Serge. Merci beaucoup de ce message positif. Elisabeth, um, I hope that you are still with us. Yes. Elisabeth, I would like yes. to ask you, yes, as a conclusion, uh, Serge shared with us some very good concrete examples to, to remain optimistic. Do you have any reason that you want to share with us that we can still have hope together? Uh, yes, indeed, I think we still have hope. One, because uh, for our purposes, much as our conference of the party has been postponed to next year, we have continued with a number of uh, uh, important dialogues which had been planned although of course now not face to face, but virtually. So those have continued, particularly the expert, smaller expert meetings, working group meetings, those have continued and have helped us to keep the momentum. We also know that uh, the president of the General Assembly will in September convene a summit on biodiversity at the headquarters of the UN in New York uh, on the margins of the 70th Uh, fifth session of the UN General Assembly on 22nd and 23rd September. And we hope then this summit furthermore will be uh, provide a unique opportunity to accelerate action on biodiversity for sustainable development. And it will also further provide that momentum to the development of the effective post able to hear at that high level, uh, heads of states and government, the, the importance and the better understanding of the nature issues we are facing now and the impacts on nature uh, leading to the current crisis situation we are. So when I look at all this, I think makes me remain optimistic that we are still on the right uh, path moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. I will ask the same question uh, to Eduardo. Um, can you share with us your reasons to remain optimistic? Well, first I want to recognize excellent interventions that preceded a really, really excellent coverage. I'm an optimistic, also realistic. I, I think we have a really tough balancing act in front of us, you know, which on the one hand, I agree, we need to be looked for ambitious goals and try to make transformative change to you know, take us away from this current path. On the other hand, we have very urgent actions to take place. You know, I, I don't think we can underestimate the vulnerability of very, very large sectors of societies that are facing and will face during the next uh, year or so, you know, the consequence, uh, the unequal consequence of this virus. So we need to pay attention to those immediate needs, right, and make sure that there's social uh, responsibility in addressing those, those needs. And I say that because at the same time, you have an incredible amount of force of vested interests that are also acting as we speak and are acting not only in extracting resource where there's no more monitoring right now, we're invading uh, indigenous areas, as I know, in many parts of Brazil, 
uh, but also taking advantages of the stimulus and recovery packages to continue to pursue the activities that have uh, taken us there. So I think we need to you know, have those two uh, goals very clear in front of us, that we need to think more ambitiously, we need to make sure we are vigilant and confronting the issues that are in front of us right now in which people are suffering in many parts of the world. Um, more broadly, I think, you know, what I see as an opportunity that is, it's quite unique is to confront what has been, I think, the mental model, the cultural model that has, you know, uh, sort of, of, of lasted during this whole time, which is on the one hand, you know, this very ingrained dichotomy between culture and nature, which we have, you know, learned to accept, right? And disconnect and not see that connection, you know, that is part of our everyday lives. I think a pandemic like this makes more clear how dependent we are on resources, you know, on, on, on resources that are produced elsewhere, the dependence that we may have on the resource in our own backyard, right? And, and how fragile all those things are. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to start breaking that, that, you know, lasting dichotomy that separates culture and nature, society from nature, right? And think how interdependent we are uh, in, in, as we live. And, and the same for another dichotomy, I think, that tends to, you know, to still be very present, which is, you know, of cultural differences. I think uh, we have, you know, learned to think about culture in the way that it stressed differences, which is a very important aspect of it. But culture, in essence, is what we all share. It basically kind of represents that we have the same needs as human beings. We're all similar. We're all, we're all the same. We share our biopsychological equality. And that's what's culture as well. And I think, you know, sort of breaking those differences and, and see how much we share, how much we depend on the same things, how much fragile we are, obey the Nico, I think will help us to change our mindsets, right? And change our mindsets in a way that, you know, helps to build a new social contract. One where empathy for each other and for nature and for future generations, you know, is sort of the center, the core of it. And I, I think we need to regain that empathy in the broadest sense, right? To look forward to a society that does not exhibit the inequality that we see in the destruction of nature that we see. So I am optimistic. But we have a lot to go for and a lot to fight for, both in the short term and the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. For a realistic, optimistic. Yes, there are some immediate actions to be taken. Uh, and uh, there is also lots of uh, solutions, alternatives and hopes. That's what I also heard from this panel. I would like to give the floor now to, to Shamila to, to, to share with us your reason to, to remain, I hope, hopeful. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And I'm listening to all our distinguished speakers here today. And I have to say that it, it, it warms the spirit and the mind to hear of the optimism. And it is in this same spirit that I want to share with you the way we at UNESCO see this future paradigm. And I think the, uh, it has been nicely framed by all of you, but I would like to say that uh, coming from the natural science perspective, working here at UNESCO in the International Natural Science Program, I fully agree with Eduardo, with Serge, and with Elizabeth that we need to bring together all these different societies, stakeholders together in this interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary dialogue. Hence, we really need to look at how to reorganize, reorganize our relationship with nature. So I am, I am very, very optimistic that humans are agents of positive change and that our future depends on our common shared values, which we all have. And we can co-create the future with the youth and especially for the young. And we need to mobilize our partners across the world, across the different ministries, so that we give importance to biodiversity as climate change today. We can look at biodiversity, we can feel it, we can touch it, we eat every day. We look at plants and trees and the beauty of biodiversity. We walk on the soil, that's biodiversity. So we need to gather and unite across the world 
because biodiversity is life, but we are also part of that biodiversity. We should not separate us from what the nature is. We are the nature. And hence, if our solutions are in nature, which is the theme this year, then let us all unite and let us create the coalition for nature. And I'm really calling on this momentum across the world. Reorganize our relationship with nature. If our solutions are in nature, let's create the coalition for nature. And, today, and together, yes, we can. So thank you once again to all of you. I do believe that humans are positive agents of change. We have made it up to now and we will continue to make it. And I want to sincerely thank Elizabeth for giving us this opportunity to be a partner with the CBD and Eduardo Brandizio to be a partner with the EPES. Thank you, Serge Moron. If we want a coalition for nature, let's build the ecological solidarity now, today, and for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shamila. So um, this is a call to gather, this is a call to share based on common values and to look forward and to also build on what has been expressed in this panel, that there are creativity, there are solutions, that there are possibilities. It was very well uh, explained in the EBES Global Assessments. There are concrete recommendations, there are concrete steps towards transformation. It takes willingness, it takes leaders, it takes champions, it takes the youth that has been mobilized in the streets that uh, want us to act also with them. So all of this has been uh, brilliantly summarized by Shamila, how we bring all these different forces together. And I'm sure UNESCO will play its role in that in the coming days and months with you all. I want to thank you warmly for participating in this uh, panel. I wish we could speak longer, but the conversation is just starting and the conversation is going to be translated into actions for transformation. That was a clear message from this panel. We need to act and we need to act for immediate uh, changes and uh, for address some, some key vulnerabilities and key diversity issues. So, and the values were coming up several times. I'm glad to say to you that there is a panel specifically on values, so I would invite you to follow it. Thank you again. Be safe and we will be in touch with you and we continue our work together. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. À très bientôt. Au revoir.